Um, so we're just gonna introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Lucero Gonzalez Ruiz, and I'm the biodiversity campaigner for Georgia's Rare Lands. I joined the team around three months ago. Um, so it's nice to see all of our supporters and to interact with you. Um, I I am born and raised. I was born and raised in Mexico and moved to the West Coast around five years ago. Um, and that's me. I have a background in education on biology from SFU. And I am also very passionate in social change and social um, social problematics. So I look forward to integrating uh, environmental change and social change. And now, Michelle, if you want to introduce yourself. Thanks, Lucero. Can you hear me? Thank you. And um, we're very happy to have Lucero with Georgia Strait Alliance. And thank you for that very uh, touching welcoming. And um, I come to this meeting with a really heavy heart with all of the news that we're receiving about unmarked graves being um, rediscovered, not discovered uh, at residential schools in Canada and in the United States as well. And um, I almost wanted to cancel. Um, but I think that this work is really important. Uh, indigenous peoples on our coast have strong connections to orca and salmon. And I think um, this is important work to honor their culture. So Mr. Lentz has been around since 1990 and we have um, been working on marine conservation issues um, to protect and restore the marine environment and promote the sustainability of Georgia Strait, adjoining waters and surrounding, surrounding communities. And our green boating program started uh, in 2000. So it's been around for more than 20 years. And we also started our Clean Marine BC Marina Eco Certification Program in 2008. The goals are to about the southern resident orcas and the threat that they face, the threats that they face, and to look at the new protection measures for 2021 that affect boaters, and to share actions that we can all take as boaters to minimize our impact on orcas and the marine environment. Chat function is open to you, so please do use uh, the chat to ask any questions, any comments, and your feedback is appreciated. Um, you can put your written questions there, and we'll have an open Q and A session at the end, where you can, uh, if you don't feel like typing, uh, we can have a conversation at the end of the presentation. And this event is part of Orca Action Month, and Lucero is going to share a link with you with. Uh, Orca Action Month events that are happening for the rest of June, since we're well into June now. Uh, and she'll share that in the chat with you if you'd like to take a look at any events going on for Orca Action Month. So let's talk about what orcas in BC waters. And I know as a boater, um, I'm sure if you're like me, that one of the biggest pleasures of boating is to see whales. And there are three types of orcas in British Columbia. We have the bigs uh, orcas that are um, prey on marine mammals, and they travel all the way from Mexico to Alaska. And uh, they have a very fluid group structure. And we also have offshore orcas off of the coast of British Columbia. Their prey is varied and include fish and sharks. And these orcas are very difficult to study based on their, uh, where, they where their habitat is located off the coast. So we don't know a lot about them. Uh, we do know a lot more about our resident orcas. The northern population, which ranges from the north end of Vancouver Island and well up the coast to Alaska, and the southern population, which is primarily from the Salish Sea in the Pacific Northwest, uh, they prey on fish, primarily Chinook salmon. And they're a very matrilineal so society and they stick with their mothers and their grandmothers and they travel in close family groups. Uh, 
as of December, there were 74 Southern resident killer whales. We had a couple of deaths last year, or one death last year, sorry, and a couple of calves born that apparently are doing quite well. And we have a new calf confirmed as of February, which is exciting news um, in LPOD, which was confirmed by the, the Center for Whale Research. The historical population of the southern resident killer whales is around 200 and um, in 1995 we were down to 98 and today we're down to 75 in, in this very uh, small and declining population, uh, which is why they're listed as endangered and endangered species. The, the key threats to the survival of southern resident killer whales is the availability of their prey. They need to eat and Chinook populations, Chinook salmon populations are on the decline. Also uh, acoustic and physical disturbance of killer whales, which um, is noise and uh, disturbance by boats and ships can also cause great damage to Southern residents, whether it's through fish strikes or disturbing their natural behavior, whether it's feeding or mating or traveling or resting, um, our activities on the water can, can cause disturbance to them. Contamination is also a key threat to their survival and um, in part due to bio accumulation up the food chain, um, being a southern resident orcas being at the top of the food chain, any contaminants that their prey eat and that their prey prey upon can build up in their bodies and also be transmitted from mother to baby orca through nursing. So we're going to look at ways that boaters can address these three key threats. So the 2021 protection measures are now in effect for Southern resident orcas. These measures were first announced in 2019 and over the last couple of years have been adapted and changed a little bit based on uh, learnings from the first couple of years of these protection measures being in place. The key change for 2021 is an expansion of the region where these rules apply, and we'll take a look at that on the next slide. Um, and in addition to um, teaching boaters and providing boaters with resources on these rules, uh, Georgia Strait Alliance also works behind the scenes. Um, we were we are involved in uh, consulting as a stakeholder in a government-led process. Um, on technical working groups to address these key, three key threats. So as you can see in the map here, we expanded, the region was expanded. The orange zone is Southern resident killer whale habitat where the Southern resident regulations um, are in effect. And this year it now includes House Sound and Barkley Sound, which you can see circled in red on the map in the top left corner. So these rules apply all the way from Campbell River um, down through the southeast corner of Vancouver Island and out onto the west coast of the island up to Euclid. So what are the rules that we're talking about? So the big one is that we must stay 400 meters away from all orcas. And the reason we have to stay away from all orcas is because most people cannot tell the difference between a transient or a northern resident or a southern resident killer whale. So in order to protect the southern residents, all boaters are required to stay 400 meters away from all killer whales. Um, there are some exceptions to that, which we'll talk about. Um, so some Whale watching companies are able to get within 200 meters of big orcas and they are giving up the right to whale take customers whale watching uh, around southern resident killer whales, but they are able to get to within 200 meters of the big orcas. Um, and interestingly, when the United States reduced the distance um, requirements from one increase the distance from 100 to 200 yards in 2011. Research showed that there was a decline in polycyclic 
aromatic hydrocarbons, which is basically boat exhaust. So not only are the distance regulations having a positive impact on reducing noise and physical disturbance around the Southern resident orcas, but it's also reducing pollution. There are also interim sanctuary zones, which are basically no-go zones. You cannot boat there and you cannot fish there. There are, um, and these zones are located on the southwest side of Pender Island, on the southeast side of Saturna Island, and also on Swiftshire Bank, which is at the mouth of, mouth of the Strait of the Juan de Fuca. Um, there are some, some exceptions to um, these no-go zones, which are that uh, if you are obviously a vessel in distress and can't avoid the zones, or if you're providing assistance to a vessel in stress, distress. Indigenous peoples can, of course, exercise any existing rights that they have in this area, so they're exempt from the rules to exercise those rights. And human-powered vessels, kayaks, stand-up paddle boards, canoes, and so on, can transit within 20 meters of shore within those zones, um, but you still have to make an attempt to keep 400 meters away from orcas if they're in the area. And people are also allowed to, to transit through these zones to access local residences and businesses. There are uh, Chinook fishery closures that are designed to allow more food for the Southern resident killer whales. These area-based fisheries closures um, are in effect to October 31st. And we're not gonna go over the, the specific fisheries closures because I always encourage people, if you're gonna harvest seafood, just check the seafood regulations because they change all the time and you need to check immediately before you go in case there are any new regulations uh, in place. But there will be closures in key Southern resident orca foraging areas. In addition to those rules, there are some um, voluntary measures to stop fishing when you're within a thousand meters of killer whales, to reduce your speed to less than seven knots within, your, within a thousand meters of marine mammals. And if it's safe to do so, turn off fish finders and eco sounders, again, to reduce noise, underwater noise. And if you can, place your engine in neutral and allow the animals to pass if you accidentally find yourself within that 400 meter zone, because we do know that um, orca, it's not always predictable where the marine mammals are gonna turn up. And so um, just wait for them to pass. And if it's safe to do so, you can even turn your engine off, which is even better. There will be enforcement, so it's strongly encouraged to follow the rules and enforcement will happen on the air, on the water, in the air and through um, technological monitoring. And there are penalties for uh, breaking these rules. So strongly encouraged to comply. I also wanted to talk touch upon some of their best practices and laws for marine mammals. So we talk specifically about the south coast of British Columbia in southern resident killer whale habitat, but it's also the law to keep 200 meters away from orcas in the rest of British Columbia and 100 meters away from all whales. 200 meters also applies if, if any whale is at rest or with, with a calf. So it's always good practice to slow down if you see a whale in the area. And it is illegal to disturb, interact with, touch, feed, swim, or dive with marine mammals in, in Canada. So um, it's best don't follow up behind them, don't cut across them. It will be considered an infraction if you stop in front of them um, even if you're outside of that 400 meter zone and then they come to you, you could be um, potentially considered breaking the regulations if you do that. 
and av avoid any abrupt maneuvers or, ch or changes, uh, rapid changes in your speed, direction. And if you have to continue underway, try and maintain a parallel path until, until you're out of the, the range of them. And definitely avoid splitting any groups of orcas or trapping them along the shore or between you and other vessels or other, other structures. I just wanted to touch on large whales. There's an increasing number of humpback whales on the BC coast, which is fantastic news. And it's also an increased risk to the whales. And of course, boats are, are increased risk to boaters. Um, and and um, there's risk of death, there's risk of damage of your vessel. And of course, there's risk of from propeller, from strikes from your boat. And humpback whales uh, don't use spinal biosonar the way that orcas do. So they're quite oblivious to boaters around them and they're very acrobatic. So it is a really good idea to keep more than the 100 meters that the law requires us to be away from humpback whales. If you see the whale warning sign, this sign is raised by any vessel that has a whale warning flag when there are whales in the area. So that lets you know to be extra cautious and to slow down and to keep your eyes out for whales, watch for blows and splashes, um, and of course, dorsal fins and tails and wonderful things that we might get to see if whales are in the area. So the whale watching regulations primary, primarily deal with um, physical disturbance and, and noise disturbance, um, and of course the fisheries closures. But I wanna talk a little bit about preventing pollution from our recreational boating activities because contaminants is one of the key threats to Southern resident killer whales as well. And we have a guide to green boating uh, available in print and on our website, which includes the whale watching regulations and other contaminants that we're going to talk about in the next uh, while. And Lucero is going to share with you a link to our guide to green boating if you'd like to get a digital copy of that. And some people wonder why um, I get asked occasionally about, you know, why do we need to worry about boats individually? A boat doesn't have that much impact, but but the reality is that there are 700,000 boaters in British Columbia and boaters tend to congregate um, and gather seasonally um, and sometimes in sensitive areas as well. So we need to be collectively responsible for minimizing our pollutants into the marine environment. So one of the key ways that boats release contaminants into the marine environment is through fuel spills and our emissions. And often the smells, spills are tiny, um, but just a few drops can cause harm and small spills do cumulatively add up. So if you report a spill, you're required by law to, re um, you're required by law to report your spills. Um, and the number that you can use is 1-800-OILS 911, or you can, of course, call the Coast Guard to report that spill. So what can we do, though, to prevent the spill? The best thing is not to spill at all. And um, the vast majority of spills from boating is due to human error. And a lot of it will happen during the fueling process. So it's really important when we're fueling our boat boats to not rush. Um, you know, it can it can be a an anxious situation where there's boats waiting behind you at the fuel dock and it's really busy and you want to get out in the water you need to make a tide or weather window and you rush um, or you top up the tank because you're going to be out there a long time and both of those are recipes for disaster just uh, slow down take your time listen to the vents for the tank to be filling up and uh, don't top off the tank because uh, fuel can expand in the heat uh, so you don't really want the tank filled right to the brim it's also a great idea to have a bunch of supplies on board to deal with spills should they happen and to prevent them so to have 
spill pads and on hand catch drips with the spill pad when you're fueling, uh, have gloves to deal with any messes that might happen. Uh, you also want to probably um, have absorbent material secured in your bilge so that when your bilge pumps out, you're not releasing any contaminants that happen to get into the bilge. And we can prevent uh, contaminants being released in a messy boat through things like proper maintenance of lines and hoses and valves, seals, gaskets, and all the connections anywhere that there's a connection that can leak or lines that can crack. Of course, we also want to have fuel efficient engines to reduce our emissions and drips and so on. Um, a lot of those old engines, you know, we don't have many four strokes left anymore. Those old drippy, noisy, or two strokes, sorry, those old drippy, noisy engines. Um, so it's good to have a new fuel efficient engine, plus it's safer as well. Another thing we can do is to make sure to plan our trip with the tides and weather so that our, we're more fuel efficient by going with the flow. And of course, if we do have any drips, um, to use drip pans if, if that's an option. Another source of um, contaminants from boats is of course waste. And we should always practice packing out what we take in with us wherever we're going. Avoid dumping anything in the water. Um, storm drains or sensitive habitats. And of course, we all know to recycle and use disposal facilities. It's a great idea to plan ahead to know um, where you're able to dispose of any kind of waste that might uh, come up that you might gather over the course of your trip. And another thing that we can do before we head out on the water is to get rid of any excess packaging before we go, maybe put things into um, Tupperware containers or plastic, any kind of uh, glass containers or plastic containers that we can keep and we can use for compost and that sort of thing after we've uh, used the products in the containers. And really it's um, one of the best things we can do is have a really good waste storage system on board so that we can set our waste aside. Uh, it's not gonna smell because it's sealed and um, it just makes keeping our waste on board a lot more pleasant if we have a proper storage system set up for all the different waste streams that we encounter. And of course there's sewage. Um, in Canada, it is legal to dump sewage three miles offshore, but we definitely do not encourage that. Uh, there are a lack of pump outs on our coast. We recognize that and that's why that loophole exists. Um, we have a list of pump outs on our website and in the guide to green boating. And I, I didn't give the link to Lucero before the presentation, but she might be able to find that pump out map on our website for you and give that list to you. Um, but it is on our website and it's updated regularly and you can submit a report if there's any errors in the pump out listing so that we can update it for other users. Um, you're also allowed, if there isn't a pump out nearby and you cannot get three miles offshore, it still is legal to bump, to, to dump sewage, unfortunately. Uh, but if you have to do that, it needs to be in the middle of the channel on an ebb, ebbing tide in the fastest flowing waters possible. If you can do that, um, plan ahead to know where and where you can do pump out your holding tank if at all possible and um, where you're going to need to do that along your trip route would be great and uh, if possible use shore facilities instead so that you're not filling up your holding tank if if you're at a marina that that you can do that especially if you're going to be dumping, please avoid the use of anything, uh, any products containing chlorine, formaldehyde or ammonia. And we're also gonna get into cleaning products as well, but I'm talking specifically about the disinfectants and deodorizers for your holding tank. Boat maintenance is another big it's illegal to release deleterious substances into fish habitat 
And that means um, that any waste that we generate when we're maintaining our boats needs to be contained. So ideally we'll be at a boating, a boat yard that has a containment area that captures all the contaminants and disposes of them in an inappropriate manner, in an appropriate manner, not inappropriate. <laughs> Um, if you're working uh, on the ground without a containment area, you can use drop sheets. Um, if it's avoid doing maintenance on windy days, those things aren't blowing around, uh, use drop sheets to keep any um, debris that may be flying in the air as you're grinding and sanding and doing all that kind of work. Uh, if you can use um, dust collection filters and, and vessel sanders and that sort of thing. Uh, you can vacuum instead of sweep, so you're not stirring up dust if at all possible. Um, it's a good idea to mix our products on shore with, with some sort of containment so that we're not spilling directly onto the ground or into the water. And try and use water soluble products and um, cadmium free anodes as well are a good idea. And aside from uh, major maintenance, there is, of course, just cleaning and that sort of swabbing the decks type of stuff. So um, if at all possible, use non-toxic products. Um, biodegradable is a problematic buzzword um, because often things that biodegrade aren't biodegrading into things that are harmful, harmless. They may, in fact, still be harmful. So non-toxic, if at all possible, is the way to go. And in the, in the Guide to Green Boating, we have a bunch of recipes for common cleaning chores that you can actually make from products in your gallery using things like vinegar, uh, lemon juice, and even there's ingredients in there with Worcestershire sauce. You'll be surprised at some of the recipe, the cleaning recipes in our Guide to Green Boating. And we also have Toxic Smart guides on our website. And um, I'm sure you know lots of, of non-toxic natural cleaning products that you can use just from common ingredients in, in the home. If you do need to buy cleaning products, uh, choose chlorine-free, phosphate-free, um, and know the, any, make sure that you trust the certification if it claims to be certified uh, environmentally friendly. Another thing to consider when we're boating is to um, conserve water because especially in some of the southern islands and actually all along our coast can be experiencing low water levels and drought and have a limited water supply. So it's a good idea if, if we're coming from a place with plentiful water to make sure we have lots on board and to really conserve water and also to, to um, decrease the use of the products that we use. You know, sometimes elbow grease can go a really long way. Abandoned and derelict vessels are an issue on our coast. I am sure you have seen many of them if you're a boater. And um, interestingly enough, it was not illegal to abandon a boat until recently. It is now illegal to abandon your boat. It's illegal to allow it to become a wreck due to poor maintenance. It's illegal to sink a boat, strand a boat, or ground a boat on purpose, and also to leave it in a poor condition in the same area for a length of time. So it can't be left alone unattended for more than a couple months within a three mile area. It's also illegal to let your boat run adrift for more than 48 hours without taking measures to secure it. And of course, weather's a consideration, which is, um, you know, I'm sure there'd be leniency if, if you were unable to secure a boat due to weather, but otherwise within 48 hours. So some of you may have boats that need to be disposed of. They may be at the end of their useful life. And when doing so, it's important to contain all waste when dismantling and disposing of if you're doing it yourself to remove any hazardous materials and dispose of them in a safe and appropriate manner. 
um, recycling, repurposing, and selling any components that are useful still, and any remaining materials that we can't, that we're not disposed of as toxic waste and that we can't recycle or repurpose or give to someone else for another use um, needs, unfortunately, to go to the landfill. If you're going to hire a company to dismantle your boat, just make sure that they're a reputable company and that they're going to do the job in an environmentally friendly manner, as friendly as possible. Now, if you want to find out resources about how to and what companies can help you dismantle and dispose of a boat, go to boatingbc.ca slash boat disposal and they have tons of excellent resources there to help anyone that needs to dispose of a boat. If, you, if there's a problem vessel out there, there's information in our guide to green boating about who to report that to as well. I did mention in BC Marina Eco Certification Program. And we work with marinas, harbor authorities, and yacht clubs to increase their environmental best practices to prove, improve on the practices they have in place and to add new practices uh, that we recommend in our Clean Marine BC Best Practices Handbook. Uh, we currently have 30, oh, that's on the next slide, sorry. We currently have 33 certified marinas, harbor authorities and yacht clubs on our coast, including uh, as far away as Kelowna. And we have another 29 facilities enrolled to be certified for a total of 62 since the program started in uh, 2008 was our first marina certified. So if you see them in the top right, that's an image of our Clean Marine BC flag. If you see them with signage or flying that flag, uh, you know it's a CNBC marina and you can also find a list of, of those marinas on our website. So before we go into questions and answers, I uh, wanted to thank some of our sponsors and funders. Environment and Climate Change Canada funds our marina work. Um, we also have sponsors with C sponsorships from CETO and Dolphin Insurance and Boating BC we've been working on with the abandoned and derelict vessels. And um, we also have gaming money from the province of BC. And of course, our many charitable donors that help us out with our work. So thank you to all of them. So um, I encourage you to enjoy it. Uh, to join our ORCA action team because then you will get notifications of any information about the Southern Resonant Killer Whales and also any activities and actions we're asking people to take to help protect them and tips like what we have been talking about today. Uh, Lucero is going to sh share in the chat a link to join the ORCA action team if you would like to do so. And we encourage you to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as Georgia Strait BC. And we're also on Instagram as Clean Marine BC. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can talk. Alrighty, thank you, Michelle, for your presentation. That was very informative, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. We do have a question on the chat from Joe, which uh, I'll just read. But in case anybody else has questions, it is a very small group, so if people want to just uh, unmute yourselves and just ask the questions, that's an option too, and we can just have a very nice informal conversation. Uh, so the question is. Couldn't the whale warning sign have the opposite effect on unscrupulous voters? <laughs> that is a um, good consideration that has also crossed my mind. Um, and the best we can do is hope that people are trying to do the rest th right thing. And like I said, there's a lot more enforcement out there than there used to be. The government's putting a ton of money into enforcing the regulations. So um, you can also report yourself any violations of whale watching regulations. And I have 
I think, Lucero, did I give you those contact numbers to share in the chat beforehand? I believe I did. So um, if you do see an infraction and you want to report it, gather as much information as you can. Um, take photos or even better, take some video footage and you can contact the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And if the, if they feel like they have enough information to prosecute the people responsible, they will do so. I think I have it here. If you can't find Lucero, I'll just, uh, you can carry on. I'll throw that into chat right now. There you go. You're muted, Lucero. I've been talking to myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, does anybody else have more questions for Michelle? We can always have a conversation. If people have any comments, thoughts. Yeah, feel free to unmute mute yourself, share your video. There's only a few of us here. Um, actually, Lucero, if you want, you can stop uh, recording and people might feel a little more inclined to chat. I think the present, okay. the formal part of the presentation is complete. So thank you everyone I'll for stop attending. The recording now. <laughs> Take care. Thank you everybody. Have a good uh, afternoon. I hope you enjoy your sunny day. <laughs>